Uh, so today we are now starting a new section in the course, which is uh, the section. So we have digital payments and fintech innovation. So now we are starting for the next four lectures in our 10 lecture series. We will be doing fintech innovations. So this is a very wide area and I really want to uh, introduce you to the various aspects of fintech um, and give you an idea of how broad this is. There will be certain aspects that we will be going in depth, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sort of, I put a lot of links and um, you will have, I will try to give you as much uh, sort of information points so that if you are interested, you can go further into each area because each area is, can be a subject of its own. So what we will do is we will have a broad overview. And I also want to introduce you to concepts of innovation, uh, disruptive innovation, um, because these are the terms that we very often hear. And these are the things that we are ha that are happening now and will be established in the future. So this course is really targeted for what is going on at the moment and what as bankers, as, as, as uh, people who will be going into senior management, who are currently in manage, uh, middle management positions, what you are probably seeing already right in your in your bank and also what to expect in the future and what you can propose as bankers uh, as staff of the banks uh, to uh, to the bank uh, to make sure that your bank is really optimizing on the opportunities and the new resources that are available in the world so this is really the purpose of this course and in the first half, actually, we took, we had six sessions because obviously payments is a very large area and there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of payment systems going on. Um, now you have the base of what is, what, where we are right now, right? And I spent a lot of time in, on this because it's very important that you know what is the infrastructure? What are we basing the future on, right? And something that is very important in information systems, any information system is, I, I discussed this in the earlier, earlier lectures as well, is what is the basis, right? It's based on what you have in the past will impact the future, right? Because unless you go for a complete overhaul, right? You completely scrap your systems, completely change your stuff, right? And start afresh, like a new company, there will always, always be a legacy. So it's really important to understand what is this legacy and what, where are we coming from? And that's why the course so far had, we had, we looked at the history, what was the regulation, uh, what is the technological infrastructure, what is the institutional infrastructure, and understanding those complex systems is very important because that is the framework within that you will be innovating on your bank, anyone who comes in, a fintech, anyone, anyone even who wants to say we are disrupting, you should first know what you are trying to disrupt, right? You first, you should first know what is there to innovate. Some, it is pointless to, you cannot innovate if you don't know what is already there because you could be thinking it is the innovation, but sometimes it could al already be there. So it's very important to understand what is already there. And that was what we did in the first part of the course. And now we are going into the next part, which is FinTech innovation, right? So we've covered all these, these sections and now we are starting the FinTech innovation part and the next four lectures, that will be what we are doing, right? Um, so the usual uh, applies, the usual house rules. Uh, the areas that we will be discussing, we won't be discussing all of this today, 
um, so what is fintech, right? So conceptually, what is fintech? Um, then the types of different fintech. As I said, it's very broad. So there are, though fintech is one word, within fintech, it is a very, very wide area, right? And then benefits of fintech. Why, why are we bothering about fintech, right? Why is so much money being put in fintech? Like word over fintech is such a big word. So why, wh what is so great about it? What are the benefits that everyone is running behind this? And then disruptive technologies with uh, fintech. Another part is disruptive technologies. There have been new ways of, so digital technologies have been there for some time but there's a new genre of digital technologies so really what is what are these technologies that are making this change right and then of these what are the technologies that are driving fintech and you will sometimes find that it is old technologies that are driving fintech that is not necessarily new technologies and then country examples why well, one reason it's important for us to know country examples is it's to understand that each country has its own fintech journey, right? So we, no country should try to compete with other countries. We can always look at other countries and learn, but it's not a race. It's really figuring out what suits the market, what suits the country. It's, it's, it's quite sort of unnecessary to go about uh, thinking, oh, you know, Norway is doing this, therefore Sri Lanka should do this. So it, it, everyone is having their own journey, right? And then how do we regulate fintechs? And then finally, uh, promoting fintech, right? So it's very wordy, but so fintech is a very new word, right? It came about somewhere around 2008, nine or so, it started getting picked up. You know, people were using this word. People, people uh, uh, type it in different ways. As you can see, you know, I have used the simple T. They have used, uh, sorry, uh, they have used the capital T. Then you have the capital T and then sometimes called fintech, fintech uh, or fintech. <laughs> um, so this is, um, as, as, as this uh, research paper rightly uh, defines it, it's a neologism, it is a new word, right? It is sort of a coined term, right? It, it, it brings together the word financial and technology, but it's not, in its pure sense, financial and technology. It, in the sense, it, it is a very specific type of uh, financial technology. Not all financial technologies are fintech because then um, all the banking technology that we have used thus far, because it is a highly digitalized industry. So all the banking technologies that we would have uh, used thus far would also be fintech. Then what are we, are we sort of retro naming something that was already there so it's really important um, to uh, figure out what what exactly is is fintech and that is not easy because nowadays what is happening is um, anything that anyone does they call it fintech right um, but we have to be careful because otherwise the beauty of the term and the usefulness of the term gets lost if you just um, if you just uh, go calling every single thing a fintech, right? So uh, the Financial Stability Board um, in the US uh, they uh, have defined uh, fintech as technology-enabled innovation in financial services that could result in new business models applications, processes, products with an associated material effect on the provision of financial services. Now look how broad this term is, right? It's technology enabled. So it has to have technology, right? That is digital technology. Innovation. Now what is innovation? That's another term that we will discuss later, right? Uh, it's, it's, there is a whole academic area on innovation and digital innovation. So I, I will 
be touching on. We, we'll see how this, how we progress in this um, session, and we will um, then. Um, I will have a session on innovation. I will either have it today, if time permits, or a fail in which we will have it next time, because that it's 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 a little heavy. It's got theory in it, right? Uh, so um, innovation is basically roughly like a very basic idea of innovation is it's recombination of existing um, technologies and knowledge, right? So it's not invention. It's it is uh, invention is something creating something totally new, right? Someone could invent the aeroplane, right? But subsequent changes to the aeroplane would be innovations, right? So um, no one invented uh, I, the Airbus A340 or whatever those numbers are, uh, but um, th those are innovations of the original aeroplane, right? The concept is pretty much the same. Um, so, uh, so it's same in financial services. So you're not sort of bringing in, you're not inventing a new type of service. It, there are pretty much things that are already there, but new ways of doing it, which makes them more efficient and therefore they result in either new business models, uh, new applications, okay, like apps uh, or ways of applying the financial services to other uh, uh, sides or other services, uh, processes, the way you do things or new products altogether, right? Uh, and it's all affecting financial services. So this is what these people are trying to capture, but try to get the gist of it. It's really broad, right? It's not just a, an app. It's not just, you know, most of the time people will say, oh, I, I, we are doing FinTech, we have an app. So just because you have a simple app after a point, it doesn't become FinTech, right? Are you really sort of doing something innovative? that others have not done, right? Um, so then there's this other, um, the academic uh, definition, one of the, I got it from a paper. Um, it says the term FinTech is a neologism which originates from the words financial and technology and describes in general, the connection of modern and mainly internet related technologies, right? Such as cloud computing and mobile internet with established business activities of the financial services industry, right? Example, money lending, transaction banking. Now this touches on what I explained in the first definition, right? So the technology is generally internet related technologies, right? We are seeing this FinTech is not the closed technologies that we uh, you know, we procure, if you take the banks or any large institution, we procure large um, systems for uh, our banking systems and all of that, but those are internal systems. F FinTech generally, right, what, what falls into the wider category of FinTech are systems that have some link to the internet. They're using internet related technologies um, to some extent because this enables accessing markets much easier, right? It changes the delivery channel, the value de delivery channel changes. And then also it reduce, it has, it has a, the ability to reduce cost, right? And reduce time. And so these, these sort of efficiencies sort of, you know, underlying though you, we won't really find it in, in uh, definitions, these underlying benefits are the things that really make something fintech, right? If it's more difficult or more complex than existing systems, it's not really capturing it. So there is a nuanced understanding also of what we mean by fintech, right? Um, and so generally we find that they use internet related technologies, right? And then, as I said before, provision of uh, financial services. So it's going to things that are existing business activities, right? In some way they are changing, uh, let's say money lending or transaction banking, uh, 
credit scoring, insurance, whatever it is, the, the traditional systems, there's an innovation involved, right? And um, so what FinTech generally captures is there's a focus on the business model, right? We will find, if you look, if you study any FinTech, you will find that there's a change in the business model, how the service is delivered to the customer. And um, FinTech and FinTechs, so the companies that generally only provide FinTech technologies are called FinTechs. Like in colloquially, we call these companies FinTechs. And they are increasingly becoming normal words. So you will find that in newer literature, in more recent, the, the T is now slowly becoming simple, right? Um, and because it is becoming a normal word, it's use something like a noun, right? Um, and and it, 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 it has a meaning on its own, right? Let's see. Mm. Hi, is, uh, any, are there any questions uh, so far? No questions? If you have any questions, feel free to answer. Um, uh, how many of you have um, uh, have you heard of the inflated work in your banks? No. Uh, Dilan, would you like? I think this is the first day you're joining us. Would you like to add something? Dilan is quiet. You will proceed. And if you have any questions, you can ask. Can you uh, see my screen? Yeah. I'm assuming, so I've gone back to the PowerPoint. If you can't see it, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll just continue. Uh, so uh, before we go into what uh, FinTech is, let's just touch on innovation, right? So this is what I said, the word financial technology. Uh, Technology and innovation has, they are not new things, right? They're, they've been there, right? If the, 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 the example of the plane is one of them. That um, the plane has been there for some time. Uh, so any new plane is, is not, and plane has been transforming. So it's not, uh, it, it's, the incremental innovations, right? So we will discuss these terms like incremental innovation and radical innovation and all those things uh, later. But we've seen waves. We see waves of changes in certain periods and we are currently in one of those waves. And it's important to understand that, right? Uh, payments and financial services for, for some time have been kind of in the doldrums. They've not really changed much and we are seeing rapid changes at the moment and that is what this interest is and after this we are expecting this, uh, sort of um, a, a, a huge change in dynamic on how banking and financial services are delivered to customers and how they are how they are approached the whole system is approached so because those change in uh, changes that we and we are in that phase we are experiencing that phase um so that's very very important i think those who um experienced the digitalization in from about the late 80s to the 90s uh experienced one phase and now we are going to, and that sort of lasted up till about 2000 um 10, 10, 15 or so, but now we are going into this new sort of more open phase. So in the world, we can see that there were 
waves of innovation, right? So first at mechanization where, you know, if you take the cloth, uh, the weaving mills, you know, they started from ha the hand loom, they went to machinery, right? And then you had steam, steel railways coming in, right? And then that led to industry. And then industry also changed the nature of industry. What, what uh, the 19, early 1900s industry versus uh, what we saw in the Japanese um, managed Japanese managed um, factories is completely different, right? Um, and they were churning out. They found efficient ways to, and efficient and more cleaner ways of uh, of um, manufacturing and then we finally find ourselves in this current age which is the digital age and the internet wave right so even though computers had started coming about from about the 60s 70s it's only post um, 85 90s even in the us and the developed countries that the internet wave started picking up right and then it came to our countries as well and this as we all know have to really change the way everything is done, right? So in current, concurrently, how did banking change, right? So what were the waves or the phases that banking went through, right? So we have this, this is why I put this phone to this phone, right? Now, this to this, the mobile phone, someone can call it an invention, but it, someone can also call it an innovation because it pretty much, was a different way of doing what this did. But when it became the smartphone, it became similar to the computer, right? So if we take financial technology, and I'm using the word financial technology without using the word FinTech here, because as I said earlier, financial technology has been there, right? Financial services were very, very early to introduce technology and we've discussed this uh, from the very first lecture, right? So the first phase is really where they start using communication technologies to uh, address the problem of speed, right? Because uh, the first issue that they had was the London, New York um, um, markets where they, if they were able to transmit the message fast enough, they could a trade without making any losses in the New York uh, exchanges. So because of this, the communication, the telegraphic communication started to be used, right? And they were like, oh, this is the perfect place to start using it because they were making money out of it, right? So it was it, it was immediately picked up by the banks and, and the markets, right? So this so the early use of technology in, in banking was for markets. It was not for a, like transmitting any personal funds or anything like that. It was for trading, right? Um, and then we have the second phase, right? The second phase is, we've discussed this earlier as well. This is where the inter, inter, interbank transactions start, right? So from around the 1960s, we have cards coming in and ATMs coming in, right? And we find that concurrently, uh, there are a lot of, it's not just, so no innovation happens in isolation. It's like someone invented the computer and the internet, it happened completely on its own, but now it has impacted all industries, right? So likewise, uh, the, 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 the innovations that take place in other industries really affect, have an effect uh, across the industry. So we need to, so you, we can't look at these things in isolation as well, right? So we have the first handheld computer uh, calculator coming in at the same time, right? And then we have um, the communication technologies become faster because remember we, we discussed this earlier as well, payment systems at the end of the day are mainly messaging uh, infrastructure, right? They are sending messages up and down. There's no actual money getting passed. Uh, physical transfer of money happens separately, but actually what all the payment systems are doing are sending messages up and down. And what we are seeing is the speed 
and uh, of the of of sending these messages and sending the volume the volumes of the messages and the processing of these messages just reducing and reducing and reducing and also technology is improving so that the cost and the efficiency has the cost is reduced and the efficiency has increased right which has made it easier to make it more inclusive for a lot of consumers and that is a process that we've really been seeing throughout the last century right and we find that uh, in 1971 nasdaq was uh, introduced uh, as it was first electronic um, uh, stock exchange and then we have swift in 1973 which all of you know and then in 1997, we start the internet bubble and dot com crash kind of starts, right? Um, then in um, uh, so the phase three is really we have to appreciate the dot com era, right? Because a lot of things happened in the dot com era. We don't talk about it, but this really is the predecessor to what we are having today and people trying and testing things right now um, we studied um, I think you might be having the links all the links here yeah just check I think ah yes so this is directly from the Wikipedia so you can links are there you can just go there right uh, so in um, for the dot com era what I what the dot com era was basically uh, would anyone like to tell what the dot com era is now madam can you elaborate please yes sorry uh, can uh, you explain more on that yeah, yeah. So the dot com era is really where the it's the dot com, right? It's where the internet companies like Amazon uh, really uh, started, right? And in the nineties, you know, late eighties to nineties, uh, as we saw earlier, you know, nineteen eighty five onwards, the the last phase uh, of uh, where internet and digital technology started rising. Um, uh, all these internet companies started coming up, right? And then what happened was their market value really increased and then from about 95 to 2000 the, uh, their market value went up about 400 percent and this was this was this was um they weren't so valuable right and then they suddenly crashed and then that is when uh, a lot of companies went down during the dot-com uh, crash right in 2000 and some survived but what some interesting points that, that we see during this time is uh, in the US and the developed countries where they had internet and more advanced uh, technologies uh, and infrastructure was we found that the, 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 the technologies or the innovations that we are sort of talking very big now, right? But they are at that time as well, right? Uh, now, one is uh, DigiCash, right? Now we talk about Bitcoin and um, uh, electronic money and all of this right now, right? But it 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 was initially uh, it came up, but it was come up, it was created by this um, researcher called David Chom, right? So he came up with this concept of DigiCash and and he created this DigiCash, right? but it it didn't work now it they were pumping in money and about 1998 they were pushing it but really what happened was this is this is something that makes things successful right now if you take e-gold again is internet money so similar to um to um uh, bitcoins right now now, why did why didn't these things work out? These are the real questions, and and the reason that I brought this in without just telling, I could have just sort of directly uh, discussed Bitcoin later in the in the in the course. But the reason that these these are important for us to learn is 
we have to understand that there are a lot of environmental factors that come in for something to be successful right when david shom came up with this it was great people were interested but not a lot of people and everyone didn't have the internet people were still you know trading offline right their their, their purchases and everything was offline there wasn't such big e-commerce so there wasn't a place really to use this electronic money right so though it was created it couldn't last it couldn't sustain itself right um and e-gold if i'm not mistaken it was it the government u.s government shut down because it was starting to become like a pyramid scheme right um because there wasn't sufficient regulations and all of that so these things what happened was the the required regulatory requirements the the development the market development the demand wasn't there so all these things need to come up you will find that even in your banks you know some people bring some innovative cool product and they just fail right and then you will find later some years after another bank will probably bring the exact same thing and it becomes a big success and then you're like oh but you know we had the same thing and ours didn't work out and then we sometimes you you know you're blaming the managers or you know something like that but actually it could not it might not be the manager's fault it could be because it was just the wrong time you know the right time right place that is is really important now 1998 we paypal was launched in 1998 right so PayPal was an interesting concept. Now, what PayPal did was, so now we talk very, like everyone is like, oh, we want PayPal and PayPal is great. But actually what people forget is that it's a pretty old company, right? It's been there for a long time now. So what PayPal did was it enabled, uh, if, do, do you all have PayPal accounts? Have you all used PayPal? Because in Sri Lanka, you can uh, buy using uh, PayPal. Or if you've been abroad. Uh, we'll have a PayPal screen later in the... Yeah, later I have a PayPal screen. So PayPal created an anonymity, right? Where you don't need to share your card detail, where you don't need to share anything. You just need to share a name and an email address, right? So that really gave people the confidence to deal, to pay people they didn't know, right? And PayPal paired up, it came with eBay, right? eBay is like Amazon, right? It's also uh, one of those dot .com, uh, dot .com uh, companies. So PayPal was actually the payment uh, the wallet digital wallet for the ebay market right so it came along it didn't come as a standalone app right so it already had its application it already had a, a demand in the market so whoever wanted to buy from ebay used paypal right so they didn't need to share their credit card details with unknown um, sellers they could just pay through the uh, paypal wallet and the money would go to the person and your details are free. PayPal was also used for, for, uh, for gambling and other activities like that online, right? So because people didn't want to use their credit cards and things like that. So PayPal became a safe, safe mode of paying uh, things like gambling, right? And that, so in, in the beginning, PayPal actually had a bad reputation because that it was it was used for activities like that um but but it had a it had a business case right it had a very good business case and it it had demand because it had addressed a problem that people had when they were dealing with e-commerce and most of the e-commerce that was um, popular early on as, as in many cases were not the you had things like ebay and amazon and all of that but it was things like gambling as well right that became very popular because those activities become popular much faster so uh it was it was through that that pay paypal survived so uh, during so, so some of the companies that didn't crash with the companies like amazon right and paypal is also one probably the only success story of that 
even when it comes to uh, payments, right? Everything else have shut down, but PayPal survived and became like strong and strong and it is what it is today. And then, uh, so it's, it's really, the reason I, I, I talk about this is to know even as managers to be aware of what is your market? Which market are you, what is your market as opposed to another bank's market? Is your bank ready for it, right? Is it, is it worthy of pushing uh, funds into something if it's at the wrong time, right? You should know what time that you should put money into and what time you shouldn't, right? So uh, understanding the demand side of it, the, 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 the de delivery channels, the value chains, understanding all those factors are really important in getting something to be successful, right? So just pumping in money for the sake of fintech innovation, for the sake of, you know, saying, oh, we did these grand things, we had apps, et cetera, et cetera. It's really important to make sure that it is something that suits your market and your company at the right time, right? And this is why I wanted to bring this dot com era, which often gets dropped. Right? Many people forget this dot com era, and but a lot of good things happened in the dot com era, but were lost because it was just too early, right? And then we come to what we call the fintech era. Era now I call this the fintech era because and not the financial technology era because fintech as i said earlier means something uh uh different right it's it's not the technology that was used before even though the dot com era was the start of fintech and paypal is like a glowing fintech uh, it's not really what would be the fintech era right it is a different it was a time of uh, trying out things in a sort of a more vacuum environment rather than uh, the era that fintech picked up Right, so we can really sort of put our fingers on early. The, the fintech era really, I think, started with uh, the mobile phone, right? Because if you go back to the reason that things like DigiCash failed, it was because not enough people had uh computers and and means of accessing uh e-commerce or, or places to pay things with you right? because just having money is pointless you need to be able to use the money right and the mobile phone really um addressed the issue of the retail customer in infrastructure we've discussed this in earlier uh, lessons as well because all the infrastructure if you recall all the infrastructure developments were done by the banks and and people with more capital and uh, computers internet connected computers it was it was a luxury right you remember in early 2000s late now uh, late uh, 1990s a car house is a computer is a car house. It, it you have to have a, a fairly good um, financial standing right and um the mobile phone really democratized the, the situation. Even though mobile phones were expensive, they were not as expensive as the computer, right? And they had a real-time accessibility. You don't need to have to be in front of the computer to use it. So it was it, the, it had the mobility that helped payment. So you don't. So when we talk about mobile payments it's not only mobile payments via the internet where you're remotely paying someone it's also uh, at at a, a pos level right it's sort of the qr uh, code um and nfc payments so the mobile phone really is the game changer and something that really i think started off the fintech era the internet was there before computers were there before but the real change happened with the mobile phone right and then we have uh, 2007, we have the Apple iPhone. So Apple iPhone, again, the reason that I put this is because the iPhone 
again is a is a is a game changer right it was a great innovation because it had the app store and it allowed it enabled um non banks it really liberalized innovation right you didn't need to have uh, a lot of uh, capital you didn't even need to have a lot of uh, experience or knowledge if you were able to just code things and put things together you were and able to meet the standard that apple had set you could create your own apps right so this really created a a mobile internet market right there was a marketplace getting developed there were apps people were using the apps to sell things buy things and apps themselves were services you know games or books or whatever it is and this really created a marketplace right and so within that you needed to have payments and when and when that market was created naturally payments and other financial services got a place to develop right and then concurrently we have the lower end of the market we have launch of mpesa right which addressed the issue of access to financial services by the bottom of the pyramid group because this is a group that was ex excluded from financial services because they couldn't physically access banks right um and the mobile phone again provided that infrastructure for people to access financial services remember these are access points right the mobile phone is an access point instead of having to physically go uh to the to the uh, bank or even to go from the computer you have the phone that is easily with you so this is a very like a huge strategic shift and you probably already know this but this the i understanding that we need to get is what is a mobile phone it is an infrastructure right it is an infrastructure that was affordable in the hands of the customer up to then up to that point the only infrastructure that the customer had was the payment card right the payment card was only infrastructure and to act, to remotely access your bank account right from the atm or from the post machine mm -hmm. you are remotely accessing your bank account or your credit card account which is also a bank account uh, it, that was the only infrastructure and that too was provided by the bank so that is a low cost infrastructure like each bank can't give every single customer a mobile phone you know they'd go bankrupt but each bank was able to give every single customer a card and ask the merchants to buy the post machine which was the the intermediary connecting point of the infrastructure right but now with the mobile phone the customer has newly acquired an infrastructure for themselves right so this is really the game changer this is why it's so important with all this we had the 2008 global financial crisis which had nothing to do with the mobile phone which had nothing to do with the internet right it was not internet's fault it was not the mobile phone's fault the global financial crisis was a separate phenomenon that happened due to greedy investment bankers who were wrapping up bad quality mortgage bonds and selling it, it across the world and it failed uh people didn't have money to pay their mortgages because they were giving mortgages to um people who couldn't pay right they were just selling giving out credit uh giving out loans and then it was like a domino stack it just kept crashing right so but what happened with the global financial crisis A lot of people lost trust in banks, right? The confidence level. Um, I'll probably I'll I'll need to pick up a. I have a graph on that one uh, in the UK and so that the confidence level in banks uh just fell to an all time low because people lost their money. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people were in the banking sector and there were huge layoffs. You might recall this. And. there were a lot of jobless bankers i was in the uk at that time um in from 2009 to 2010 and i remember um the security uh, 
guard of uh, the place that I was staying, the accommodation that I was staying, was a previous uh, bank from a top investment bank, right? It was that bad, like they just didn't have jobs. There were so many unemployed bankers. Um, they were everywhere. They were perfectly, you, when you speak to them, you can see that they're perfectly fine bankers, very knowledgeable and all of that, but they, they, they were working as, they were doing things like being security guards because they just didn't have work. Um, and um, so that was very sad. But what it did was it created an excess knowledge in the market, right? There were people with knowledge of banking who knew the shortcomings of banking, but without work, right? And also a market that was suddenly rejecting banks. They, they, didn't, they didn't trust the banks anymore to take care of their money. Or, and they also felt that banks were not using their money to the best uh, use as possible because the consumers weren't getting very good deals. The paying for the consumer was very inefficient. Credit to the consumer was very um, expensive. Um, and uh, credit was not very safe either because what happened with uh, the financial crisis was when they couldn't uh, pay, you know, they were just foreclosing and we, people realized that the banks really didn't love them that much. So we have now, again, you know, that environment gets created for fintech. Right, we have a demand supply situation which becomes perfect for a third force to come in. Right, so at the same time, we find now new technologies are happening. Right, so 2004, 2007, the technology is, is, is getting used in banking services. Right, in 2008, we have uh, Betterman starts as a robot advisor, they actually start giving out money in 2010. But Betterment is established as a first robot advisor, right? So now the human being is getting wiped out and technology is coming in, right? And then 2010, contactless payments becomes um, becomes popular. Um, and then um, 2011, we have Alipay that starts the QR code, right? Um, Apple starts using uh, start introduces Apple Pay, right? Apple Pay again. Uh, Apple Pay really changed mobile payments. The idea of mobile payments um, in developed countries because a lot of people there use Apple phones, right? And even though PayPal and all of them had mobile payment apps, they were mostly used for internet payments. Uh, people were not using it for post level transactions, even though the, the possibility was there. But with Apple Pay, what Apple Pay did was um, it embedded the card in the app, right? It, it, it was not it was not a very like conceptually it, it's not so advanced, right? It's sort of you know nowadays if you look at the apple pay like what what is so great about it even at that time you know, not a bank so the bankers were like oh uh, in the uk and the us so they were like well what you know what is this such a big big deal all they did was they embedded uh, the cards in they took they used tokenization and they embedded the cards in the app right and then you could pay uh with uh, through NFC, so to the POS, it was a contactless payment, and um, and um, a lot of people started using it. And then Samsung Pay came, Google Pay came. Um, they all followed, and that really changed the mindset. That people started thinking of the idea of uh, using the phone di directly for payments, right? Instead of having the card, instead of having an intermediary right directly using the phone for um, uh, 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 post level payments right so uh, in in countries like london they started accepting it in the underground as well so uh, the underground was anyway using um, uh, having a transport card and then they used the nfc uh, payment card as well and then they started allowing apple pay and google pay and all of them because they were still using the card right so uh, with that, the idea of uh, paying through the phone became a, a normal thing in, in Western countries. 
but by this time, this this concept is already established in country like China because uh, they they were kind of behind, right? Uh, so they didn't have a lot of banks and all of that, and they had the issues of uh, unbanked. But because those countries had the economic boom and everyone got their phones really fast, like even if they were poor, they had a lot of uh, smartphones. They had already started using QR and and they kind of started making those advanced um, mobile uh, based payments much earlier than the Western countries. Again, we are going to the question of the issue of legacy. Where are you starting from, right? What is your history, right? If you already have established cards, like cards are very well established in Western countries, um, then it's very difficult to dethrone cards or, 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 or to disrupt the cards because people are already you know, comfortable with cards, they're happy with cards, their life is fine. So then trying to change their payment habit is more difficult but if you're introducing payment the payment if, if you never if your people never never using cards and they were using cash then it's easy to introduce the phone right now in sri lanka we are highly cash based but we also have a lot of people using cards right it may be more difficult to get the people who are using the cards to use a mobile payment app or a QR code than it is to get the person using cash to use the QR code or the mobile payment app, right? Because the person who's using the card is already having a fairly convenient uh, technology in their hand and they already have it. They already have it. So they don't necessarily need to, they, they need to, they need a lot of incentive to switch. And these are the realities. We need to understand what the market we are working with. Whereas a person using cash and hasn't started using card might directly go to use the phone because now they are more familiar with the phone because before, from a very young age, they've been using the phone, right? So they're very familiar with the phone. So understanding where the market is, is really important if we are, when we are going forward. So Alipay uses QR code, which is contactless payments in 2011, but the Western countries really start picking up from about 2014, right? And then we have uh, countries introducing uh, nationalized QR codes. Uh, Bharat QR was in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Then in 2018, we launched the Lanka QR standard. And from 2020, we have been sort of uh, promoting it all out. Right? Are there any questions so far? Any questions? Any questions? No. Okay. If I'm going too fast, let me know. It's 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 a very very wide area. Is there a question? No. Okay. No. Um, right, let me just go back to the slides. Right, now, this is the rise of smartphones, right? This is why I am telling you that it's very important because it is. And um, this, the, 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 the forecast is that obviously it's just going to increase, right? Um, and the numbers are in billions. So, it's it's almost like most of the world population, right? Now now we have a situation. It's like half the world population has a, a smartphone, right? So this instrument, it's it's going to be interesting. Now this the smartphone, like the card, might become a legacy instrument. Right, where you know, just the way I said, okay, the card holder might not be interested in moving to the smartphone that fast. The smartphone user may not be interested in moving to whatever the next technology that fast. And the the innovations that are happening now are using are based on the smartphone. Right, those people are putting in a lot of money to um, 
develop apps and any solutions for the smartphone right and the smartphone really hasn't become that much smarter in 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 the ongoing years of course the processing speeds have increased the battery life has improved uh, the security has improved but the conceptually the smartphone is is not much different now, if you take someone who's using something like a Samsung J7, um, which is sort of a low-end uh, Samsung model from a few years ago to whatever the latest Samsung model is, uh, there isn't, in terms of functionality, in terms of sort of the experience, yes, there's a big difference. But in terms of what the J7 owner can do and the S, I don't know, S10 or whatever the latest number is, um, can do is not significantly different, right? It's not significantly different. Uh, so, which means that uh, the apps and the innovations that are coming are now developing their innovations for this existing technology right so if a new technology comes in we have a situation where everyone will have to leave their smartphones and adopt a new technology or we will be continuing to use the smartphone because that is what now everyone is used to right and we see this it's the smartphone that you get is getting continuously improved right we will the, the things like laptops and them they are changing as well, but we find that the lab, the smartphone is just becoming more and more and more advanced. It's, we are kind of now getting logged in. The word is called logged in. It's called technology lock-in, right? Like when a lot of people have the same technology and they've already invested in it, there's kind of a lock-in and then you, it becomes difficult to get out. Like even with the credit cards, there is a, to an extent, a technology lock-in, right? Because now people have invested a lot. People have post machines whatever it is and then the incentives are continuously being given banks have set up entire like buildings for card centers and card card branches so there's a lot of lock-in right and until those people are ready to move out they, they will be constantly um, incentivizing for that technology to be used right so with the smartphone we are we are we are going into a case situation of a lock-in, right? So, with, so even if something better comes along, there might be a delay in that being adopted simply because there is already now an increasing lock-in going, right? Um, because people are talking about, oh, you know, we don't need the smartphone, you know, maybe people will have a chip in their brain, uh, where they just think and things are done. Probably that will become possible but whether people are ready to put a chip in their head as opposed to be happy with the smartphone we will have to see simply because they have invested a lot and they're also used to it right now there are like people who can type really fast and all of that so we'll see how it goes but keep in mind there might be this locking issue very soon or maybe it's happening now when new technologies are getting wiped out because um it has, it's, they're not smartphone compatible, right? You have to become, so even if you're more advanced, you have to uh, bring it down to the more popular infrastructure standard. Is that clear? Is that point clear? It's, it's kind of an important point. Is that point clear? Hmm. I hope it is. If you have any questions, let me know. Yes, madam. Okay. So, fintech. We are going to fintech. Now, this is, if you haven't tried Google Trends, you must try Google Trends. You can even try it with your own name. You just have to type Google Trends and uh, type in the word. Then you see how often it has been searched, right? And um, so we see that uh, the interest over time picks up from about 2014 right in the word fintech now fintech has been you know it's like people have been toying around with the word it's it's been there it's been there and it's really picking up right and uh let me see so this is the time right 
So this is around the timeline when the word fintech starts uh, picking up. So about 2013, the word was getting popular. Fintech was getting popular from about 2013, but it was still pretty new. I remember that it was still, and it remained being new for some time actually. Uh, and I think in some parts, even like maybe amongst us, it still is quite new. And that's why we have these courses. Um, but um, it has fairly established. And I think this spelling is the real telltale that the familiar, familiarity of the concept. Uh, and I think the way people type the word kind of indicates their familiarity with the concept. Um, so, um, so the total value of investments into fintech companies worldwide from 2010 to 2020, right? This is in billions of US dollars, right? Here again, you can see that from 2014, 2013 was when it was started to pick up. And then we see a fair growth, right? 2020 is an odd year as we all know because of the COVID closures. But uh, we see that this trend is pretty much then 2019. So I have seen a lot of fintech uh, uh, investment in fintech, and really these are the these are the companies that were really feeling the waters, right? These were the pioneers who were taking risks and um, the bankers, the tech companies. And then from about 2017 onwards, 17, 18 onwards, we, FinTech has become more established, right? There is a better market, there's more trust. People understand it more. Um, because of that, the, the investments have been going up because simply because there is more demand, right? And it's more sustainable. Um, right. So let's see. So uh, Statista is a good place for you to go if you want data, especially at like regional worldwide level. It's very easily accessible. Of course, you can get data from uh, IMF, ADB, World Bank, uh, all the central banks have their data as well. But uh, generally for sort of general purpose to get a good indication of things, I think Statista is a very easy to go place for data, right? Um, so yeah, so let's just take a look of what all those numbers mean in real terms, right? Um, so new UBS, UBS is a is a uh, investment bank. I think it's in Switzerland, um, and uh, focuses on 200 million US on fintechs, right? So this is banks are investing in fintechs. Now this is an important relationship for us in this course, because what is the relationship between banks and fintechs? First, banks were fighting with fintechs, right? Um, I've been studying this for some time at, uh, at a more international level and um, internationally, like banks, most banks like hated fintechs. They just couldn't stand fintechs because these were these tech companies um, who were coming in to sort of disrupt the banks and you know make changes. A lot in in uh, like Europe and less and mostly in Europe, mainly in countries like the UK uh, and um, the Scandinavian countries. Um, and it, it 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 became a real headache for them because. Uh, the banks were comfortable in their ways and they were just recovering from the financial crisis. And then here comes this bunch of like young kids in t-shirts saying that they're going to disrupt the financial services and make all these changes. So from about 2013 to about 2015, 16, there was this constant sort of tussle between banks and the fintechs, right? Um, but then they realized, okay, uh, fintechs realized that they, need more knowledge and experience and then the banks have the accounts which are most important and they also have the infrastructure they have the the capital as well right 
and uh, banks realize hey these fintech guys have something to contribute to us that we might not have the skills for because we have been trained for something else so because fintechs were taking part of their markets you know this is simple, this is simple business sense right where you extend your your these are like vertical integrations and horizontal integrations that are happening and a lot of banks started uh, buying fintechs so they started acquiring the capabilities that the fintechs had just by buying fintechs and a lot of fintechs actually their goal was not to become successful companies they wanted to just be bought by banks right because they would create a great app for some solution and they would basically um, uh, market it around and then have get a bank to buy it at a very high uh, price and then they can either go on to the next project or retire or whatever it is but um, there was a lot of money going into fintech and there still is right so market value of big fintech companies rises to 1 trillion more than the largest banks right so here in this in this lower one right it says market caps of payment stocks like visa mastercard have eclipsed with the high value wall street's biggest bank so here interesting point visa mastercard right which were traditional card companies right we all know this right then visa is not even a company it's a it's a it's, a, uh, it's sort of a conglomerate but um so they are now considered fintech companies right so this is how you evolve and visa mastercard stopped calling themselves card schemes they started calling themselves technology companies right and most of them they if you have already seen the apps they they like the apple pay they integrate the card into the app right and they use tokenization and all of that um so uh, they've evolved right and that's what the banks are doing as well banks are trying to evolve and stay in the market because there is nothing to prevent customers from leaving the banks and going to fintechs right so you unless you acquire unless you adapt and survive uh, you will become a dinosaur and disappear so i think that's really why everyone is changing and transforming and then if you look at um, the the from the government side if you take uk or any of these sri lanka all these countries the governments are constantly reviewing financial technology and to see whether the best is coming out for the country right so there is a lot of interest so that the tussle has died down there is respect on both sides uh, there is also a, an understanding of each party's shortcomings but um, there is an understanding of the value that each party brings in right so it's very important that that is uh, appreciated so let's go into what fintechs are and fintech applications right um so i think we touched on some of these terms already so fintech is is a is a very wide area as i was saying all this time and it's made up of a lot of things right so if you take fintech it will comprise a very wide range of things from crowdfunding mobile payments robo advisors insure tech reg tech there are many other sort of subcategories within these as well and then the technology that is being used now we very broadly use the term internet related technologies and mobile phone based technology right but within those there are sort of other categories of technologies right so artificial intelligence and machine learning that's one area right and then there's big data right? we'll, we'll touch on these areas as we go along and this there's robot ro robotic process automation right so where the robot advisors and all of them come in and then there's blockchain right so those are some of the things that we already know of course in the future there could be others right 
uh, these are not exhaustive lists that is the most important thing for you to remember these are not exhaustive lists they can expand they can contract you can put them all into one if you can stretch them out um but the real takeaway is that uh, there are a lot of new ways of providing financial services and there are a lot of variations and advances in technology that are enabling the provision of uh, traditional financial services in new ways right um so let's go to these one by one any questions so far any questions no okay so as i said you know it's a very wide area that's why i just put this next slide as well i want you to be familiar with these words um and and uh, there's a lot out there and these are as i said again these are not exhaustive right um so fintech now there's open banking anyone knows what open banking is Anyone knows what open banking is? No. Um, we will touch on open banking uh, in the next lessons. Um, Sri Lanka is also working on an open banking framework. Open banking is basically opening banking accounts, bank accounts, and uh, customer information for third parties through mainly through the use of uh apis open apis right and then there are frameworks uh technology frameworks regulatory frameworks which they have to comply to make sure that the sharing of the information is safe right so that's the sort of open banking in a very sort of gist but um, it's a way of again extending the value chain right extending the delivery chain um towards to the customer and and, and having and really sort of demarcating having a division of expertise or services you know because we have banks extending themselves like stretching themselves to the full extent of customer services uh, up to the cust retail customer and then in the process they obviously have to choose what they do right and they have to forego certain things but when you have third parties you know where you who are who can do other services then you can make more of the 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 information and the data available right uh peer-to-peer -peer lending right uh now peer-to-peer -peer lending is is what is peer-to-peer -peer lending any ideas So, lending uh, interbank? No. There is no bank involved. Right? So, now this is uh, the reason I wanted to point this one out is peer to peer. Who is the peer? The mm -hmm. peer is someone who's your equal, right? So, equal. the customer, right now, banks are what is their job? They are intermediaries, right? They're financial intermediaries they are take they are mobilizing deposits from the general public and then they lend it to the people who want money right that's the basic job of a bank right payments is another job but the basic job of a bank is de mobilizing deposits and giving now the bank is the intermediary now the bank is the one that has been causing all these problems you know giving low interest rates and for the depositors and giving uh making it difficult for people to take loans and all these problems so there now it's there are those issues now customers are com complaining all world over these are always the issues now people and with the financial crisis in europe and the us this became worse because um people didn't have jobs they had no way of good getting loans and uh, people didn't trust banks because banks were crashing so they didn't know where to go and put their money so all this sort of huge anomaly and then people were thinking hey why not you know why am i wanting a bank in the middle let me just go do it is there a way for me to find uh, people who want money so that i can directly lend to them 
and so these when these issues were coming up and then lo and behold we have the internet right so that is a marketplace where then uh, there is a platform so fintechs came in they provided a platform to connect right uh, crowdfunding is the same they create platforms most fintechs create platforms they create platforms for uh people for two sides of the market to meet right they create marketplaces digital marketplaces and um so instead of going for traditional financing people go to these um online uh, peer to peer lending or crowdfunding places and they get at a lower cost so they don't have the cost and they have a lower sort of credit rating requirements uh, and all of that and there is quite a lot of peer to peer lending going on in the world right now right when we are going we, we will touch on that a little later so alternative credit scoring what is alternative credit scoring so there's a way that uh, banks score uh, people's credit right can you tell me how you do the credit score of a customer maybe based on the age income level uh, and uh, all sorts of their wealth uh, the assets uh, and liabilities they have uh, giving some points to each category thereby to arrive at a, a scoring yeah so basically uh, based on uh, so those are the traditional ways of uh, Uh, credit scoring right so uh, that's that that is the, the 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 always the joke right you have to be rich to get a loan and right? so uh, you have to be able to you have to prove that you can pay the you loan. can even you fund the bank you, yeah you can you need to show that you don't need the loan uh, to get yeah. the loan <laughs> uh, so um, but uh, the reality is the other way around right so Yeah. So the so what the 2008 financial crisis did was people really started rethinking. You know what is this? You know what is going on? How do we solve our problems? Because there were people who needed money and couldn't um, get their money because they had you know bust. They had not paid their mortgages and all these problems. You know how do how do we how do we solve this problem? um so alternative credit scoring was like hey you know there are other ways especially if you are young it's very difficult to get a good credit score if you are young and young people are the people who want to start businesses they want to get houses they want to pay student loans and all those things they are the people who need money and it's most difficult for young people to get money and uh, and so it becomes a vicious cycle right so then these companies the people started saying hey you know we might be able to come up with a different way to make sure to see if we can trust this person to somehow repay right and this is again where open banking and open api custom information comes in right you can uh, so these fintechs what they do is they pull data from several sources um you know your payment pattern like do you how do you regularly pay your electricity bill and do you default on your electricity bill do you default on your credit card bill you know smaller things like repayment behavior customer the behavior of the customer you know is this person uh, where is this person's funds coming from this person doesn't have a salary job but this person is having some uh, continuous income it might be small but it is steady right it's not it's not big enough for a traditional bank to give it but it is steady so i can see that it is there is a steady flow of income and then some people even when i've seen these uh, these pictures by these alternate credit scoring um, uh, fintechs and some of them were saying okay let's look at uh, their facebook profile you know who are their friends you know what sort of you know, maybe we can and some people are willing to even share that right I, but that is a more difficult and there's a huge sort of privacy concern there as well uh, but those are different ways that we can look at uh, a customer and these were uh, and and because technology open apis the ability to draw 
from multiple sources of data and create a new picture of the customer rather than the traditional picture where the customer gives the pay slips and you know maybe some references and things like that and their creep reports and things like that that you, the reality is that there are maybe honest people who will somehow repay their loans, but they can't prove it. So they were trying that they try to find alternative metrics to that may indicate this person's repayment capacity and trustworthiness, right? So this is what alternative credit scoring is, and this is these and the reason that this is very important for us to learn as bankers is we need to know what is out there in the market, right? How the market is changing. And some banks are also adopting these now, that they are also creating their peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. They are also, a lot of, in other countries, uh, in uh, Europe, open banking standards have already been introduced in Australia and several other countries. Serena is also looking at the framework. Um, but um, these, these are the things that we need to learn, right? Because it, it might be, might very well have to start considering at least for lower level uh, smaller loans and things like that this may be already even being considered by banks right now things like transaction delivery small ticket loans and those are things that have reduces cost right where you use uh, where you take away intermediaries and cost uh, you cut costs when you because most of these fintechs run on very low margins they have very small staff uh, very low overhead so they can reduce costs right so these are these cost cutting uh, mechanisms uh, digital wallets we already know things like uh, free me paypal those uh, and, and most of our banks have them now Asset management, again, instead of going to going and paying high fees for investment banks and things like that, you know, um, uh, from the fintech itself can draw, the, you, know, you give them access to their bank account and then they will manage your assets. They're saying similar things for budgets. So we have to, you know, for, for, for our generation and uh, generations above, this might be like, really scary um you know just let a third party gain access to your account and manage your assets and you know invest on your behalf but interestingly the newer generations aren't like that and also the trust levels are very different now in um in germany uh, a few years ago there was a fintech called sofort right it was a payment app and what they did was they um, they made their customers give their bank account details in the internet bank account details, including their passwords, right? And people would and they were using screen scraping to get this, and uh, people gave it like the German. It is this German company which is operating in Germany, and the Germans trusted this other German company with their internet banking password to make payments on their behalf. And it actually happened. So the country context really affects, that's why I said at the beginning, the country context will change. Now in Sri Lanka, we won't approve such a thing. Like it's very specifically, we won't even think, I don't think people, I don't know how many people will agree to that and give their passwords. They might out of lack of knowledge, but not out of trust, um, like trust, but a sort of a naive trust, right? But, um, but these things happen these, these things are possible right so we, we we need to understand that each market is very different um and uh, we have digital banking uh, uh, digital insurance there are sorts of new things this is, i mean it's such a wide wide area there's so many new things it's just, just some of the things right um and uh, that we will uh, we will we have we see right now and many more could come right um so let's just go to payment fintechs i'll just touch on so i'm touching on these four five sorry there's five here <coughs> and um and we'll just touch on those as main areas but just go and research on these right the reason really what i want to do is introduce these concepts to you so that you know that these things are happening out there in the world 
because these are not some external things. These are happening for banks, right? These are happening in the banking industry, the financial industry. So this is happening in your hood. So you have to have to know that it's happening and what what they are and how they could affect you, how you could adopt these. You know, you could be a step ahead. You don't have to wait for it to come from outside. You yourself can initiate these things. And you yourself can initiate uh, some safe way. Now, sometimes in the fintechs, you know, if you have to be a lender, when the fintech is doing it, it's risky because they don't have the capital safeguards or, or, or the necessary KYC requirements or things like that. But if you take a bank, the bank already has those things in place. So you can give a value added service. So the, this is sort of how you need to see yourself in this changing environment. How can you add value and give a better product, right? Um, and maybe how can you partner with fintechs? You know, how can you acquire new cap capacities, capabilities and knowledge, right? Um, so fintechs, payment fintechs. So payments was, one of the first areas to be uh, affected by fintechs, right? Because the retail customers were kind of ignored by the banks, right? Uh, the banks, as we learned in the past uh, few lectures, most of the infrastructure is geared towards large corporates, right? Uh, the slips payments, uh, all of that, you know, they, they can directly connect and, and make those payments, but the but the retail customer had to either go for cash and then they had the check or they had the payment card. So the uh, payment card was really what they had, right? If the internet payments, everything, they had to settle with the payment card. The payment card was costly for the merchant. It was costly. Not everyone could get the credit cards. There is risk of, you know, the debit card where you lose money and all these issues. So paying was an issue it's not something limited to sri lanka it is a it was a global issue right because sri lankan uh, technologies replicate uk and you know those countries uh, infrastructures as we studied uh, in the previous things so our problems are pretty similar we didn't have an unbanked issue like in kenya or in india but we definitely had the issue of um, the retail customers being ignored like in many other countries so uh, that's why things like paypal came about right so uh, payment fintechs mostly address the retail customer uh, the access in right how to access their money right so alternative ways of accessing their money and uh, mobile payment methods such as e-money payment apps payment gateways they all you know became very very common now what really is this fintech what is a payment in fintech right now this is the traditional if you're going to pay with a card right you have that you have to put all this information right but what and this and a lot of uh, i think if you have worked in cards uh this is a point where in e Commerce, they lose customers and that's why in a lot of uh, uh, e-commerce payment sites they say do you want to save your card right because once the card is saved this process becomes much faster and people uh, are happy to pay a lot of the lot of the lot of the uh, large e-commerce companies any in most of the e-commerce experiences at this point you lose the customer because they can't be bothered feeling all of this and after they feel all of this then they then there's a red mark somewhere and then they keep saying something is wrong and then you have to verify the, all that they just give up right so what uh really a lot of fintechs have done is simplified now paypal was one of the first right they simplified it to such a level that it was down to you just signing in or if you have already signed in there's no issue you just click pay right it's integrated and you just click pay and it's really really easy now if you're paying with your free me or something like that you know if you go to kegels or something you just give your mobile phone anyway you're giving it uh, when you're giving the getting the points and then you're just paying once you get used to sort of that level of convenience you don't go back now i i have a freemium account 
and uh, online payments wherever freemi is available i use pay using uh, freemi because it's just much easier and i don't have to keep typing my uh, giving merchants my credit card information online right so there's a big security um, uh, safeguard there as well so these are the ways now this is uh, the uh, uh, local interface for payments right uh, this is a local app this is the paypal app and this is qr code right again that you don't have to use cash or cards you can directly just scan it and the the intermediation reduces right so this is really through fintech what is happening is points in the interme intermediation uh, of the payment uh, is reducing and it becomes efficient and safer and less costly right so that is really what that 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 is the nuanced point of fintech so when they're talking you know innovative business models and they're saying innovative processes this is what really it means it's more efficient it's cheaper it's faster it's safer those are the things that, that they are talking about right um and cheaper could be for both the bank or the fintech or the consumer anyone right so you get a lot of efficiencies by using these new technologies which are very flexible they can have multiple connections to multiple points and and just uh, reduce the complexity to the customer right now if you look at the app on top and this and this and this the real dif difference is the complexity has been reduced the actual payment the back end infrastructure really hasn't changed this is what i'm saying this is where you're coming from if your back end infrastructure is the old infrastructure it is still that old infrastructure the card visa mastercard they're still using 1960s infrastructure which has been continuously evolved and developed but not scrapped right so remember this the, the back end is still having their own set of changes right but it is when it comes to payments it's the front end that is getting innovated quite a lot right um right crowdfunding um so what is crowdfunding can someone tell me what crowdfunding is okay so crowdfunding is another the sort of a alternative to bank uh, loans and and getting credit from banks right because there are a lot of people who need money and can't get money um for various reasons right and then uh, so i said talk about platforms right a lot of fintechs create these platforms where you connect markets uh, the demand and supply right and one of those things is uh, funding now if someone can't probably give uh, it's it may be difficult to find someone to give you $10000 but it's easy to find someone to give you $10 right and it may be easy to find many people who can give you $10 right and uh, you can find th not only 1000 you can find even 10000 people who can give you $10 uh, because the internet is is accessible to the whole country and the whole world so you can get funding from places that you can't otherwise access from people that you can't access right so this is what crowdfunding is about and crowdfunding is actually very very popular in um, many developed countries and there are different types of crowdfunding right there is reward based crowdfunding where it's like you you get a product or it's sort of you get a reward right and then there's donation based where you just donate you know people want to help people out right so you, you just uh, give them some you know 10 rupees or 10 dollars or something and then there's crowd investing right where you uh, go in as an investor there's crowd lending right and then there is invoice trading so there's a different types of crowdfunding Right, where you get interest, you get discount, you get uh, just 
happiness which from donation crowdfunding so there are just different ways of sort of connecting with people you know the 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 real needs and the real behaviors of people and this is something that as banks we need to be more aware of because of the internet people have places to express themselves and really meet their needs right so we shouldn't uh, be strictly sort of in the old framework just thinking no this is the way that people should be done if they're coming this is the way they should be given the loans we should also try to be innovative to see how do we solve a problem without without creating a financial instability scenario but how can what are the what are the ways that we can mitigate risks and solve people's problems right because remember there is money involved in all these points except for donation there is a return involved in all these points and there are a lot of lot of um, uh, lot of platforms that enable this crowdfunding right um sorry so now i'll just take it the gofundme um now this is a definition i i, I have put you i i'm giving all investopedia um, definitions because they're very simple and straightforward right uh, so crowdfunding is the use of small amounts of capital from a large number of individuals to finance a new business venture right crowdfunding makes use of uh, the easy accessibility of vast networks of people through social media and crowdfunding websites to bring investors and entrepreneurs together with the potential to increase entrepreneurship by expanding the pool of investors beyond the traditional circle of owners relatives or venture capitalists so it's going beyond the traditional people who use you would go to get money because through these platforms you can access a wide range of people right so i'll just go to the gofundme so just to show you this this is a donation based uh, sorry so Are you okay to go on until um, eight thirty, or would you like me to stop in about fifteen minutes or ten, fifteen minutes? I'll just finish this slide and then we can wrap up because it's a weekday. Yeah. Where is my GoFundMe link? Oh, it is going there. All right. So this is GoFundMe, right? So. Look at these causes, right? Help Nafia, acid attack survivor, right? And then, um, just give me a second, I need to take this call. Sorry, I had to take that call. Um, yeah, let me just go to the GoFundMe page. So these are all, all this uh, Ginny pool, funerals sub and support, right? Uh, so uh, people will, people just, um, if we go, here we are. Now look, he has, he has asked for 1 million and he's raised this much, right? So he's almost there. So. Now this person, he she had wanted only ten thousand, but she's gone gotten almost fifty nine thousand, right? So because your crowdfunding, you're getting way more than you wanted, right? Because you are get you're sourcing from such a wide pool, and that's that's really the beauty of uh, that's really the beauty of uh, uh, crowdfunding, which which we need to. Um, um, uh, understand and and this disrupts the 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 existing uh, traditional uh, formal and informal uh, ways of funding right um another is kickstarter right 
on Kickstarter is a crowd investing uh, platform, right? So here we are. Uh, so this is they they want to get funds for this um, active footwear and if you go to these now they have already um, surpassed their goal right more than double and more than three times sorry more than three times so um, this is this is the beauty of it so they, instead of going to a bank. Uh, they have gotten crowdfunding, right? They have gotten such a big amount. Uh, so this is the beauty of uh, these platforms. We need to understand what's going on in the market and what, what, where our competitors are. We, we are looking at our traditional competitors, but our actually competitors are elsewhere. So how do we make the best of these changing times, right? Um, then, um, Another point is crowd lending, right? So cloud lending can happen to consumers, businesses, real estate, you know, it goes across the board. So again, if it's through platforms, uh, they, they go, uh, they, uh, the platform tries to, as the platform advances, they will keep adding sort of stricter rules to make sure that the repayment happens, right? And they have KYC processors and all of that, and they have to abide to whatever the national regulations are, right? Uh, then we have uh, robo-advisors. What are robo-advisors? Now the robo-advisor is, let me just, basically it's not the financial advice, it's not doing yourself, it's getting a robot to do it, right? Now, If you take this video, right?
So this is why I want to show this uh, that that to you. Uh, it shows how the banks are responding, and this link that I have as banks responding. It's uh, of Schwab, who was um, who was featured in that video as well. So the banks. This is really the important thing. How do banks respond to the change? And what we are seeing in even in Sri Lanka, actually, where banks buy uh, fintechs, right? You acquire that knowledge, you acquire that capacity, and you really evolve, right? There's no point in crying, saying, oh my God, I'm losing my job, or my, my staff is losing their job. No, they need to evolve and to adopt the capacity. It's like, it's like uh, the computer and the typewriter and the typist, right? The typists who learned, who evolved into using... Um, the computers actually had their jobs because after a point uh, people realized oh there are a lot of things that need to get typed and we do need typists we, we do need secretaries we do need assistants um so uh, they when they evolved they they had their jobs but those who didn't evolve uh, had to you know take vrs or whatever and leave so it's really on how well banks evolve and banks are evolving right and you can find these links as to the top robo advisors and uh, the Schwab's uh, portfolio as well. It's it's interesting to look at. It. So Schwab's is one of the top U.S. investment uh, banks. A um, lot of um, it's 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 very high. It's, though we don't know the name very well here, like J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, uh, Schwab is actually a quite a old, very well trusted bank uh, in the U.S. And um, the interest, is, so they have different models. So if you want a, a, a person to advise you, they give you that. And if you want a robo advisory, they give you that also, right? So the reason i'm saying this is because this is how these banks are adapting so they offer if you go to the schwab's link right uh, this is how they are they are very they are very open about it right so here they are they are already saying here our robo advisor does the work so you don't have to they also have um the the uh, the normal financial advice uh, giving the, the the relationship managers as well right so that this is how they are um, adapting to the environment right um, and then you have the professionals as well so this is how we need to adapt they they you have to accept the reality and adapt to what is going on um, right, um, InsurTech. Uh, so this is uh, the other thing uh, in the in that sort of main uh, chart we had. Um, so InsurTech. So just like in payments or in banking, insurance is also a, is a financial service, and uh, use of fintech in insurance is also increasing but insurance just like in just like the financial services it has the same uh, sort of the complexities uh, or different it's i mean it's similar because it's highly regulated um and uh, there's big risk involved right so the traditional insurance providers are not going to get wiped out but they are losing certain parts of their market and they need to adapt as well right um 
so the real purpose now here, what I've said, it's lowered the cost because the intermediary costs or the, the overheads are not there for them. So this is how it really changes the game. Uh, reg tech, right? I mean, we'll stop there today. We have some more to go, but uh, we'll uh, stop there today uh, and proceed in the next one. Um, so reg tech is using technology for regulation, right? This is getting began began in in large markets where the compliance requirement is very high and the use of uh, digital banking and digital financial services is increasing as well uh, reg tech is really picking up and as you can see look at the investment right the growth in investment in reg tech right it's really increasing and almost four times, right? From 2017 to 2018. Um, so RegTech is the management of regulatory processes within financial industry through technology, right? And already the, we, we have regulated technology, you know, we have for FIU purposes and all, you have flags, you know, it, moment it passes a certain amount, you know, ping the system will give you an alert, right? Or, you know, if if some if a PEP is making some transactions, I'm sure your systems are having some flagging systems, right? Um, so those are sort of very basic reg tech. Uh, reg tech is just getting more and more advanced with, with, the, with more advanced technology that is available, right? So uh, reg tech uses technologies such as advanced analytics, right? Um, robotic processors, um, cognitive computing, and cloud-based computing to achieve regulatory and compliance outcomes more efficiently and effectively, right? So what it basically doing is it is, uh, you know, when the, when the numbers are too high, it is difficult for manual uh, compliance. And this is why they, are, they, they look at uh, customer behavior, uh, uh, transaction patterns, uh, global mapping of their, where their wealth is going. Um, and through that, they then generate data for compliance and uh, regulatory purposes. And this is increasingly becoming more and more important. So it's not just sort of mainstream bankers, even people in compliance, their jobs could be um, disrupted if they don't start getting these new skills to use these new technologies, right? Um, and, and adapting to the needs of the market and the regulation as well. So there are a lot of changes happening. Uh, what I always tell people is you have to adapt, you have to hone new skills. Now, even us as regulators, we are learning these things afresh, right? We have, I studied this quite in depth, uh, but uh, both we are all learning these things and because we need to be ready for the market, we need to adapt. Otherwise we become, we, we become irrelevant, right? If we don't have the necessary skills to do our job. So it's very important that we um, uh, really gather this understanding as well as figure out what, how we can use this to the best of our advantage. So I will stop there uh, for today. Uh, and uh, are there any questions? And we will next lesson, we will go to the technologies that contribute uh, to FinTech and then proceed with the, um, proceed with the rest of the, um, the rest of the lecture. Are there any questions so far? Is there anyone here? Yes. Are there any questions? Yeah, madam, not from this uh, fintech part. Uh, yeah. Just from the this uh, digital payment uh, side. Uh, now, have the theft limit has been increased to ten million on online platform. To, to how much? Now, uh, online banking platforms. Yeah. And we transfer 10 million uh, process, uh, 10 million transaction? First, 10 million. Yeah. Mm. 
to my knowledge no but i will double check in case i missed out on something yeah actually now uh, i was also sure of uh, about the 5 million threshold so yeah. i uh, was with another client uh, actually the ndb platforms allow to do a single transaction up to 10 million so okay, let me i'll check on that one i'll check on that one and let you know yeah. okay. Uh, okay, also you i think was it you who um wanted to know about what the rtgs uh yes the, the cut off time so there was a circular i checked on that and there is a circular saying that now the banks have to keep it open until 12:30 so for, for the branches uh -huh. So it's oh, not 10 30 it's now 12 30 we've extended it it's from a circular itself we've asked the banks to keep mm -hmm. it open so if your bank is cutting it off at 10 30 you can tell them it's uh, open until 12 30 now there is a circular yeah thank you um and in the so uh, in the afternoon we have uh so there was before 12 and after 12 and afternoon we have a lot of sort of the omo the ilf we have a different set of transactions that come and so the trans though it's 10 10 uh, though it's cutting off for you at uh, 12 30 we are open until uh, uh 4 30 uh, 5 is the time that we close sorry 4 30 is the time we close so until that time we continue with our transactions so it's yeah. at the bra branch level that this uh, 12 30 uh, cut off time is there yeah. And one more thing now, there was a recent circular from Central Bank, uh, uh, some extension, uh, I mean, revised regulation on the Exchange Act of 2017, mm -hmm. uh, that issue of debit cards to uh, the people uh, go overseas. So mm -hmm. they are they allow for those who go for medical purpose education and and for business allow to mm -hmm. use the debit card outside uh, the country okay okay so then uh, anyway the student is uh, currently identified as a local citizen even though uh, residing overseas so you mean once such, they go abroad they can continue to use their card is it is debit that, card. yeah yeah this is the eftc one right yeah the most recent mm -hmm. uh, so according to that uh, so can we allow uh, uh, the debit card being used by a student who might stay mm -hmm. more than uh, a year overseas uh, I will check on that one. Now you have to check with the uh, foreign exchange department. Uh, uh, Asela, yeah. Asela, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will check on that one uh, as well because that specific one. I'm just trying to find the find the. I think that uh, that uh, the circular came uh, most recently and effective from 22nd uh, March, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think it might be travel related to health. I'll check on this one now. Yeah, thereby uh, what happens is you now uh, for the students who go overseas for their studies, uh -huh. so we do have a mechanism maintaining a student file. Uh -huh. 
-hmm. by giving a debit card so we lose the control how the this uh, money is getting withdrawn from another country mm -hmm. for the living purposes mm -hmm. so because you don't have uh, uh, this one right way of controlling and the other thing is now according to the new thing so mm -hmm. the banks are supposed to i mean uh, check whether if a card is given yeah, to a temporarily temporarily for business education this one right you're talking about yeah temporary yeah yeah so temporary is less than a year right temporary less than a year yes yes so i think that should be the i mean i can check with them but generally when they say with let's say with the give us a time of what is temporary uh, mm -hmm. it should be less than a year because it says temporary mm -hmm. um, but i will uh, check because temporary could be I, I i we have to find a proper definition for that one right yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah i'll check on that one also if it's urgent uh, asil you can directly call the foreign exchange uh, department and department. ask as well. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I am presuming because it's uh, temporary. Generally, it has it to be less than one. Yeah. I think so. I, I, but we have to we have to verify that one. Um, right. If there isn't anything else, we can stop. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, I will send you this part of the presentation and uh, the rest of it I will move to the second one and if the speed is too much or you can't understand anything uh, just let me know because we are covering a very wide area and it's important that you get a sort of an idea of what we are discussing and all of that. Right you. Okay. Good night. Okay, thank you. Good night. Oh and also sorry the next class. Um, so because so last sunday 12th because no one was there uh, i just decided not to have it because there's no point and then i just cancelled 17th as well because i thought everyone will be on holiday and that's why i yeah. thought of having it in the evening is it easier in the evening uh it should be okay yeah so yeah we'll just try it out and just have sort of one and a half hours uh, sorry two and a half hours or two hours lectures and just spread it out a bit um so i'll tell Karlinga when the next presentation is i'll just uh, discuss with him and ask him to send you an email right thank you good night thank you.